Welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies, a podcast dedicated to exploring thoughts on philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. In today's podcast, we're going to be asking and answering the question, is my pocket journal a horcrux, or does my soul extend out into my journal? Now, to set this question up, I want to talk about the journal that prompted this question for me. Now, a lot of you are probably going to call this a moleskine or moleskin journal, but I heard someone pronounce it as moleskine once, and I can't stop doing it. So I want to talk about my pocket, squared, hardback, moleskine journals. Now, I started using these journals because my top five strength finders are input, belief, intellection, achiever, and activator. And so with those come, you know, the strong belief, and I want to have a lot of input on these strong beliefs, and I want to think about my strong beliefs. I want to do stuff. I want to be an achiever, and I want to start stuff. I want to be an activator. So when I started taking my faith more seriously, my Christian faith, back in 2013, I started reading lots and lots of books, and I started listening to just an unreal amount of YouTube videos. And from this, I generated a lot of thoughts. But as I generated more and more thoughts, I realized that some of them were good, a lot of them weren't good, but the ones that were good, I had a really hard time remembering because they're just bouncing around in my brain all day. I had to keep rehearsing them. I had to you know, fuse them together, turn them into various concepts, and then reflect on those concepts. I had to rehearse them as I went to bed, because I was so afraid that I would lose them in the morning. And so then one day I just started researching notebooks. I found this really cool leather sleeve from Saddleback Leather that fits uh, these pocket journals perfectly. And actually, I bought the leather first and didn't know it didn't come with a pocket journal, so I had to go out and find that. And it actually took me way longer than it should have. But so since 2013, since actually I have the date because I date these things, Since August 6th, 2014, so I guess it took me a year to to get going on this, I've filled 15 of of what I call, uh, what do I call them? Volumes. So I write the volume, I write the date. There's really just 15 and a half of these pocket journals. But I periodically open them up. I reflect on my thoughts. I pull podcasts out of them. I pull blog posts out of them. I pull master's papers out of them. So this represents what I've deemed my best thoughts since August 6th, 2014. I even scribble in the front of them. I I scribble various memes and archetypes, philosophy and theology tokens, and different like life mottos that I want to live by, that that I want to continue to reflect on and shape me as a person. So I, I hope you're starting to be able to see why it's tempting to think of these things as a, as a horcrux for me, like this huge, this huge aspect of my mind, of my soul, my heart and soul resides in these pocket notebooks. So are they, are they horcruxes? Do they represent collectively a, a single horcrux? Are there a bunch of them? Is there 15 and a half horcruxes that I've created? Well, in order to answer this question, let's get into what a horcrux is. Now, from the best I can tell, Horcruxes are an invention of J.K. Rowling for her legendary Harry Potter universe. Like, I I don't think that this is some kind of witchcraft outside. I think that she invented it. So if that's wrong, someone please correct me. I don't know a a ton about witchcraft, so someone can school me on that. What I do know about Harry Potter and J.K. Rowling, I had to learn as an adult because as a kid... You know, Harry Potter, for an evangelical Christian growing up, was the devil. You're not allowed to to read that. And actually, my second and third grade teacher, she rounded up, Mrs. Reckley, was reading. uh, She she decided to read us Harry Potter books because they're so popular at the time. My dad got wind of this and reamed her out. And so she she had to stop reading. But then one day, a couple weeks later, I go down to the lunchroom. I look around. No friends anywhere. Can't find them. So I sneak off, I head back up to Mrs. Reckley's room, and there are all my classmates and all my friends sitting around as she's reading Harry Potter. And she looks up from the book with this pained look in her eyes. She's 
she says, Parker, you can't be here because your dad won't let you. It's like a, a traumatic thing. I had to go back down to the lunchroom and sit by myself like Steven Glansberg. Um, fast forward a couple years, I get back from a wrestling tournament or practice, something. I get back home. I see this giant stack of Harry Potter books. My dad had read through all of them. I'm like, Pops, what is this, man? Like, you ruined my childhood because I couldn't participate in, in uh, class with my friends. And he goes, well, you know, I read them and I don't see anything wrong with them. It's like way too late, just traumatic. Anyways, enough about my childhood trauma. Let's get back to it. Okay, so a, a horcrux is something that allows you to split your soul and put it into different objects, whichever you choose, in order to ensure immortality. So according to HarryPotterFandom.com, a horcrux is an object in which a dark wizard or witch has hidden a fragment of his or her soul in order to become immortal. Horcruxes can only be created after committing a murder, the supreme act of evil. The process for the creation of a horcrux involves a spell and a horrific act is performed soon after the murder has been committed. There are usually protective measures made to prevent a horcrux from being stolen and destroyed, such as counter charms and curses. So in the Harry Potter stories, all you Harry Potter nerds out there, you guys already know it, but if you don't know this, I'll give you a little bit of background and hopefully it's accurate. So in the Harry Potter stories, this guy, Tom Riddle, who ended up becoming uh, Lord Voldemort, this dude whose name should not be named, he makes his first horcrux out of, a, out of his journal. So again, you're, you're starting to see the theme here. He spoke to this basilisk snake thing in parcel tongue, which is like, like snake talk. And he got this snake thing to kill this girl named Myrtle. And then Myrtle haunts this bathroom. And then he was able to split a piece of his soul and hide it away in the journal. So then throughout the, the Harry Potter stories, Voldemort does this a bunch of other times. And there's like this huge long story of, Vol of Harry and his friends going off and finding Horcruxes and killing them, destroying them so that he can finally kill Voldemort. So spoilers, sorry. If that's what a Horcrux, like, do I believe in Horcruxes? Why would I ever even consider asking if my Mola Skinne journals are Horcruxes? Like, do I, do I believe in dark magic? Have I been slaying people and trying out spells in an attempt at more at <laughs> immortality? No, I do not. Of course, I do not believe in that kind of dark magic stuff. But this, this all becomes way less magical and a little bit more philosophical once we understand Andy Clark and David Chalmers' uh, extended mind thesis. So uh, let, let's go there before this gets too, too much more magical. Now, th the extended mind thesis became famous after a 1998 paper by Clark and Chalmers called The Extended Mind. The Extended Mind thesis is a form of externalism concerning cognitive processes. In their introduction to the paper, they ask, where does the mind stop and the rest of the world begin? And they explain, the question invites two standard replies. Some accept the boundaries of skin and skull and say that what is outside the body is outside the mind, Others, impressed by arguments suggesting that the meaning of words just ain't in the head, which is a nod to Hilary Putnam, they hold that this externalism about meaning carries over into an externalism about mind. We propose a third position. We advocate a very different sort of externalism, an active externalism, based on the active role of the environment in driving cognitive processes. Okay, so I know that that can be kind of confusing. We're talking about externalism and internalism inside the head, outside the head. But I think this can be made a little bit more clear if we consider calculators and post-it notes. So think back to when your teachers uh, told you you have to memorize your times tables, right? There's not always going to be a calculator around. You're not always going to have a calculator. Dude, totally wrong. They botched that one. We all have calculators on our phones and we carry it with us like all the time. So they, they botched that, and they probably wasted a lot of time. Like, I, we don't need that. We outsource that kind of mental work 
uh, we, we outsource that to our phones, to our calculators on our phones. And we literally do have it with us all the time. It's, a, it's become part of who we are. That load is taken off of us and it's put onto our permanent calculators. And so in that sense, we don't have to use that part of our mind anymore. It exists outside of us. We don't need the times tables because we have this calculator that can do it way better than us. Now, if you're not convinced by that, let's think a little bit about post-it notes. Now, I often write myself post-it notes, and I stick them all over my desk. And throughout the semester, they start shifting and moving. I start crossing things off. But again, this is taking off the mental load of remembering those things. Those things come in and out of my consciousness. It's it's all sorts of stuff. It's papers I got to write. It's things I got to do. Take out the trash. All sorts of stuff comes in and out of my consciousness. And it does it so much so that I have to literally write myself notes to remember them. And so these are thoughts, my thoughts. They're not anyone else's. They're my thoughts that I've written outside of my body onto a post-it note in order to bring that thought back into my consciousness so that I'll think about it again and then go and perform the action that I've thought about. And so you can see right there, like my thoughts are out outside of my head. They're, those are my thoughts in the post notes. They're out there, and I don't have to expend any mental energy trying to keep those in my conscience. In my conscious, I don't have to to bring them back in because they're already there. I wrote them external to myself. Okay, and and this is like what I do with my journals, right? I don't have to spend all this mental energy rehearsing my thoughts anymore because I know they're out there in my external hard drive, which is my pocket journal. Okay, so we're, we're starting to see like the impetus for why I would even ask the question about horse, horcruxes and, and moleskinate journals. Clark and Chalmers proposed that while some mental states such as experiences may be determined internally, there are other cases in which external factors make a significant contribution. In particular, they argue that beliefs can be constituted partly by features of the environment when those features play the right sort of role in driving cognitive processes? If so, the mind extends into the world. Okay, and then they go on to give this analogy or the story, uh, this intuition pump about Inga and Otto. And they hear about this art gallery expo. Inga hears about it from a friend. She hears where the location is, and she goes down to the art expo building, wherever it's being held, and she goes in. She remembers where the building is, and and then she goes in. Okay, no problem. That's just the normal situation that happens. Otto, on the other hand, has Alzheimer's. And so Otto keeps this journal with him with all sorts of facts and stats and things that he'll need. He hears about this art expo. He decides he wants to go. He looks into his journal and remembers from this note that he has. Maybe he doesn't even remember. He looks at the note of where that building is, and then he goes to that address, and he does the same thing that that uh, Inga did, right? So Inga used her memory to get her to the art expo, whereas Otto used his memory in the form of a notebook to get him to the expo. And so we can see that Otto's notebook is functioning the exact same, or analogously, directly analogously to Inga's memory, her biological memory, her her brain. So what they say is, <clears throat> they say the moral is that when it comes to belief, there is nothing sacred about skull and skin. What makes some information count as a belief is the role it plays. And there's no reason why the relevant role can be played only from inside the body. I, I think they're right about this. I think the auto case is really good. Uh, this was early on in their career, but later they, they talked about post-it notes on your mirror for someone with Alzheimer's. So they got all sorts of notes and do this, don't do that throughout the day. Here's what you're supposed to be. Here's the pills you're supposed to take. And if you took that person with Alzheimer's out of their apartment, out of their house where they have uh, all these memories that are built into to their whole uh, their whole world, if you take them out of there, it's, it's like taking them out of their brain. It's like 
you know, removing them from a huge part of their mind because their mind is so situated, it's moved external to them because of this cognitive deficiency within their skull and skin. But it's important at this point to protect against any kind of like woo-woo stuff. Now, I think you guys know what I mean by woo-woo, right? Like the spooky, mystical mumbo-jumbo. The thought that if my mo- my moleskine hardback squared pocket journal is an extension of my mind, then shouldn't I be able to like experience life from the perspective of my pocket journal? Like, do I have any memories of what it's like to be put inside of my pocket? And then to take that even further with the post-it notes thing, can I just write a bunch of thoughts on post-it notes and, and post them all over Illinois and be like omnipresent throughout the state of Illinois? Can you just throw your thought post-it notes everywhere in the world and become God? Well, no, of course not. That weird, like spooky stuff, that woo-woo is what I'm saying we, we need to avoid. And I propose that we make some important distinctions in uh, in order to avoid that. So we need to distinguish between soul and mind and consciousness. So I want to argue that our soul is like the substance that we are, essentially. Uh, Richard Swinburne's written about this a lot, where he, he has a, a really good book that just came out called Are We Bodies or Souls? And it triggers so many Christians because they go, well, we're a psychosomatic unity. Yeah, okay, cool, man. That means body and soul unity. But essentially, we're a soul because we are Christians. We believe that the bot, the body will pass away. We'll get a new glorified body, but our soul can endure the death of the body. It can survive it. So essentially, we are this thinking thing. Like Descartes said, we are a soul. And so that's like this substantial form of what we are. That That's what we are. We're a soul. But we are a soul who has a mind and who is conscious, conscious, conscious. There we go. Okay, so our mind has the capacity to be extended out beyond our skulls. But our first person inner consciousness, I'm going to say, cannot. So we're making this distinction between the mind and like the inner conscious mind. So there's there's all sorts of things that are in your mind that are not that you're not aware of right now. There's all sorts of like beliefs, there's all sorts of memories, there's all sorts of yeah, like tons of stuff that is not presently in your conscious awareness. And so we can see that right away there's a distinction between your mind and your consciousness. So in making this distinction we are guarding against what's what's called panpsychism. Now, panpsychism is the view that consciousness is everywhere. So we're talking about extended mind, not extended consciousness. Extended consciousness would be like you, like the the pocket journal being conscious, right? And every atom being conscious. And there there are panpsychists out there. There's some really sharp dudes that are panpsychists. I think that's That's pretty bonkers, actually. So we're making a distinction. The the soul can be conscious, and while it's embodied, it can be unconscious. right? So you can go to sleep, and you can not dream, and I think you're unconscious. You can get knocked unconscious, and that is your soul not interacting with your body in time and space. And you can have contents of your mind which are not present to your consciousness at the moment. And so we can have the extended mind thesis without having the extended consciousness panpsychist thesis. Right? I, I think that's pretty clear. Okay. So in, distinguish, in distinguishing between contents of minds and the experience of phenomenal consciousness, that is the, uh, the what it's likeness of your conscious first-person experience, now this this what is this what its likeness that goes back to Thomas Nagel's 1974 paper what is it like to be a bat and he it's a really good paper you can find it for free online i suggest you read that it's really cool um it's really cool because he talks about the irreducibility of the subjective perspective 
in science, we all want to talk about this third person perspective, the objective, objective perspective, right? But Nagel says you cannot ever escape the subjective perspective. Like you can have both, but you can't only have the third person perspective, the objective. And this is a point that C.S. Lewis makes over and over, which is why I admire him so much. The dude was a beast. So anyways, when discussing discussing phenomenal consciousness, the term qualia is often brought up and the singular quale. So qualia is, qualia are, I guess, is a plural, hotly debated today. You know, what is qualia? Is there such thing? There's these guys, reductionists, who want to reduce away all qualia experience. There's others who say that qualia just is consciousness and still others who talk about this type of qualia and that. What I mean by qualia is just the what it's likeness. So you have a quality experience when you're conscious. I, I think the two are pretty close to synonymous, if not synonymous. But when you look at like a red tomato, you're having a qualia experience. You're experiencing a quality of the, like the redness. And there's a what it's likeness that you're going through. You're conscious and you're looking at a red thing. It's appearing redly to you. When you eat a strawberry, it's there's something that it's like to bite into that strawberry and taste the juiciness. Like there's something that it's like. That's the consciousness I'm talking about. That's the qualia experience that we have in mind when we're making our distinctions here. So we can talk about Nagel's bats and qualia in a later podcast, but for now, I think it's sufficient to know that there is this distinction between phenomenal consciousness, that consciousness of you know, being awake, that first person perspective that you're experiencing right now, there's something that is like for you to be listening to the Parker's Pensies podcast. And it's something that's really awesome because this podcast is great. And there's also the contents of our mind, which extend out past our phenomenal consciousness. So now I think we finally have enough to answer this question. Is my pocket journal or her a horcrux? So like in, in the literal sense, I would say no. Because I, I don't think that this kind of dark magic evil voodoo woo woo stuff exists. I don't think that I'm I can I'm capable of splitting off my soul in a real like literal sense and putting it into a journal. I don't think that's what's happening. But I I do think that they serve an, as an extension of my mind, though not an extension of my conscious inner mind, my phenomenal consciousness. So. They serve as an extension of my mind because they are taking away the cognitive load that it takes to remember these ideas. I don't have to rehearse them, and I can write them down with way more detail than I can when I'm just holding them in my mind. And so uh, this pocket journal that I have in my hand is like my external hard drive. It's full of all sorts of ideas that I've thought through, that are half thought through, that are warmed over, that are chewed up, that are advanced, that are unadvanced. Like this is this is an aspect of my mind. It's crazy to think about. I know that. But I, I think it's true. I think these notebooks are actually an extension of my mind. And for my loved ones who read them after I die or when I'm not around, they serve as an analog of various aspects of my thought. So they're not coming in contact with my substantial soul, but with my thoughts. They can get a sense of like who I am and what I was thinking about. They can know my thoughts. So in a sense, they can get inside my head without literally getting inside my head. And they, it's, they can get inside the important stuff, my thoughts, my beliefs, my intentions, my desires. That's, that's really cool if you actually think about it. I wrote a journal to Julie. Uh, I started writing that back in 2013 for sure. Uh, it was to my future wife. And then once I met Julie and once I knew I wanted to marry her, I started addressing it to her. But that journal, I don't remember every word that I wrote in there, but it is my thoughts. It is my desires. It does represent like my affections for her. And then when it literally became for her, those are my thoughts. That's an extension of like my soul in a in a metaphorical sense, not like the substance. My there's nothing woo woo about it again. My substance isn't in that journal, but my heart, like, is expressed through the words that I use. 
and it represents an extension of my mind. I think that's nuts. That's so cool. And though we definitely want to avoid the woo-woo stuff, I think it's pretty cool to focus on the power of words. There's real significance in the power of words. And this is a biblical concept as well. In the beginning, God spoke and it was. God created the heavens and the earth. He said, come forth to all sorts of different animals, and they came forth. The book of Psalms described God as this star breather who breathed out the star with the stars with, with his word. Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, is called the word of God, the logos in John 1. There's something really, really cool about words. We can do things with words. That's a famous book title. And if you're familiar with Kevin Van Hooser at all, a famous theologian, systematician, one of my favorite professors, he makes a big deal about us doing things with these words. We can, they're called speech acts. And when we do these speech acts, we are performing things. So when I say, I now pronounce you husband and wife, if I have the authority to do that, I've literally made you husband and wife. <laughs> that That's pretty sick. So words are important. I love thinking about Donald Davidson's triangulation argument, where he's, he talks about the need for words and language in triangulating between one person and another on a specific object. So we do this with our kids when we teach them all the concepts that they have, or at least the, the basic concepts from which they can build new concepts from. And so my sister looks at my nephew and says, you know, Fledgy, here's a triangle. And he goes, Titito. He can't say triangle yet, and I give her a hard time about it. It's super cute, though. And then she gives him a different color one, a different size one, whatever. She's developing the concept of triangle in his little brain and in his mind, in his phenomenal consciousness as well, in his soul. And so without language, we wouldn't be able to think. We wouldn't be able to have these concepts which are developed over time through this process of triangulation. I think this is so sweet. I hope you guys are getting geeked out about this like I am. But there's some really weird and interesting implications that Chalmers talks about and Clark talks about and others who are proponents of this extended mind thesis. And that goes like this. If Otto, let's say, this dude with Alzheimer's, if he is depending on the journal that he's been writing in to help him think and reason in reality and remember stuff, if this is part of his extended mind, then if you take that and you burn it or you blow it up or you throw it on the train and it gets ran over the train tracks, like you've done more than just destroy property. You, it might be like assault and battery. You've taken away part of his mind. He depends on that. That's his, like his external hard drive. I think there's some really interesting implications you can come up with, some, some weird things going on. If you remove someone from their home, and stuff them in some kind of old folks home when they're used to all the surroundings that they're in. They have these memories that are built into the different, uh, the different ways that the furniture is arranged and uh, they have post-it notes all throughout their, they're basically living in their mind. It's extended all throughout their, their uh, surroundings. If you take them out of there, that might be like punishable. Like that, that's a really big deal to do that. So I just wanted to broach this for you guys. I think it's interesting. Um, I, I think that in a sense, like insofar as words can represent your heart and your soul and your thoughts and your intentions and your desires, insofar as that is the case, then yeah, my Moleskine little journal here is an extension of my mind. And again, not of my conscious mind. I'm not trapped in here. It's not like the Harry Potter version. But it's, it's not just a notebook. I think that's nuts. I don't know. You guys let me know. You know. Comment, post, like, subscribe. Do all that good stuff. I want to hear what your guys' thoughts are on this. Um, I want to read a little bit more about it. I want to resist panpsychism. I think that is bonkers. Um, but it's, it's cool stuff. We could talk about this more, and perhaps someday we will. But for now, that's going to have to do it. I hope you guys learned something cool. I hope you guys thought about something in a new way. This has been Parker's Pensies, and as always, all glory.
to God. 